Good morning. Welcome to worship with First Christian Church in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. If you're worshiping with us virtually today, I'd like to welcome you as well. Please gather something to eat and to drink for communion later on in the service. And if you have prayer requests, uh, please register those in the contact card. Let's start off with our announcements. We have prayer group and Bible study tomorrow at 1 and 2 o'clock, respectively. Uh, this month, we are continuing to collect deodorant and also bread mix, uh, cornbread mix for the Concern Pantry, so please bring those. I'd like to continue to express my thanks and my admiration for everyone who's working so diligently on everything from preparing, we're preserving our history to researching member inf information, finding new life in ministry for our musical instruments and our AV equipment. So many jobs and so many people who are, are willing to jump and to help the church in its final days. Are there other announcements? Sarah. Okay, Concern can still use your egg cartons, so please. Sounds good, sounds good. One more way that we can help with the Concern Pantry, bring those, bring those egg cartons. Are there other announcements? Let's go to God in worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please rise for our call to worship and our hymn of praise. Please join me in the call to worship. Now is the moment of grace. This is the hour of blessing. Today is the day of salvation. Already joy is abounding. For this is the day God is making.
time, we come, we come now to our time of prayer, to our time of sharing our joys and our concerns. I see a familiar face back in the crowd, Faye. I want to say welcome back. We're glad to have you back. I hope your luggage has arrived from your travels by now. <laughs> Finally it did. So that's a praise. God in your mercy. Are there other concerns? Faye, yes. Oh my goodness. Alex Martinego, okay, in the ICU in St. Louis. God, in your mercy. Let's bow in prayer. God of true blessings, we are surrounded each day, each hour, each moment by your presence. We live our lives showered by your grace and your mercy, and we are grateful. This morning we gather to thank you and to praise you for the fullness of our blessings. We confess that sometimes we forget that you are the source of all things good. Make us ever thankful. We confess that sometimes we forget to share those blessings with others. Give us more generous hearts. Help us to comfort those who mourn, to feed the hungry, to minister to all whom your son Jesus called blessed. We ask these things in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. I don't know if you've all noticed or not, but the last, I think, three weeks, we've put the words to the choir anthem on the back page of your bulletin. So you may want to want to actually take a look at that, and you can not miss a single word. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at the disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May God add blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these words of Scripture. Place, space, matters. Leaving the Magic Valley in Idaho for Enid, Oklahoma, was a jarring experience for me. Phillips University was nearly half a continent away, but what was even more troubling to me than the distance was the landscape. The flat, stark, Western Oklahoma landscape produced an unexpected feeling of a strangeness of place. When winter came and the deciduous trees shed their leaves, the discomfort became even more acute, even more apparent as the flatness and the fullness of the emptiness of the landscape was revealed. The plains lacked the valley's protective hills, that bowl of surrounding hills that I was used to having in my eyesight. And in, in an Idaho winter, the vistas are still green with the pine trees that never shed their leaves. But in this new place, this land and its trees were shockingly bare, and all of its inhabitants were as exposed as the land. Our physical location in this world can affect us in ways that we don't even recognize until something pulls us out of what is familiar. Place and space make a difference. They matter. Today we heard the text that's commonly referred to as the Beatitudes or Supreme Blessedness. Jesus' message harkens back to his first teaching in that synagogue where he read aloud Isaiah's good news to the poor, reversal of fortunes, and he announced that on that very day that scripture was fulfilled in their hearing. But the text that we read today is not the version of the Beatitudes with which we are most familiar. When we think of the Beatitudes, most of us, or the blessings, it's usually Matthew's version, not Luke's. The differences between the Beatitudes in Luke and the Beatitudes in Matthew are important, though. Matthew's Beatitudes are longer than Luke's. There are more of them. And in Matthew, Jesus speaks to the crowd from the mountaintop. In Luke, Jesus is down on the plain. In Matthew, Jesus' words are spiritualized. Blessed are the poor in spirit, as opposed to Luke's more stark, blessed are the poor. And Matthew does something that I think most of us appreciate. Matthew omits the woes. We don't like the woes 
of Luke. Everyone likes the blessings, but they're not too crazy about those woes. Jesus had just been up on the mountain where he had named his inner circle, his 12 disciples who were to witness to all of the earth. And then, unlike in Matthew, Jesus comes down from the mountain. He comes down to a level place to a massive group of disciples and followers and learners. And yet, preaching is not the first thing that Jesus does. Remember what he did in the scripture? He healed. It was a massive communal healing. That power went out from him, and everyone was healed, mind and body and soul. And then Luke tells us something extraordinary. Jesus looked up, looked up at all those disciples and began to teach. He wasn't pronouncing from on high, Jesus came down the mountain. He healed the people, perhaps even kneeling or sitting in front of them. In the process, he looked up. Can you imagine having Jesus looking up at you? And that's God with us, in the midst of us, not looking down from above, but on our own level, even looking up at us. Anyone who's worked with small children knows that there is great benefit at getting down on their level. When you sit down on the floor or you crouch down to meet them eye to eye, there's a connection that's not made if you're making pronouncements from up here. Jesus looked up at them and pronounced that they were blessed. But what does that mean? I've seen some translations that say, happy are those who dot, 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 or fortunate are those who dot, 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 But there's another translation that I believe captures the sense of the word a little better. It's being in a state of righteousness with God. If you're blessed, you're in a state of righteousness with God. But it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue in the Beatitudes. When you're poor, you are in righteous existence with God. When you are hungry, you are in righteous existence with God. And when you mourn, You are in righteous existence with God. Being in righteous existence with God carries a whole lot more freight for me than being blessed or being happy. The best and most puzzling news, however, Jesus says that being in righteous existence, being blessed, is present tense. It's not future tense. It's not something that we have to wait to be in righteous existence with God. Because when Jesus came, he announced that that process had begun, that he had brought part of the kingdom of God with him. What Jesus was telling them was that what the world says about blessing is all wrong. The world says that those who are worthy are rewarded and blessed. Today, a lot of folks say hashtag blessed. We see that all the time. We hear a lot that God will bless us beyond belief with whatever we need or whatever we want as long as we're worthy. And that's just wrong. That's not what Jesus says about God. Jesus says that if we are suffering, not that God wants us to suffer, if we are poor or hungry or mourning or being hurt by the world for Jesus' sake, we are already in righteous existence before God. Pastor Nadia Boltz Weber preached in a sermon on the Beatitudes that Jesus was God's Beatitude, God's blessing to the weak in a world that only admires the strong. Jesus was God's Beatitude because for Christians, Jesus ultimately is the face of God. Jesus is that bridge to God for us. Jesus is the bridge for learning how to live in righteous existence with God, no matter how much or how little wealth and power and status we have in this world. One Sunday, as a mom and her young daughter were driving home from church, the little girl turned to her mother and said, Mommy, there's something about the pastor's message this morning that I didn't understand. And the mom said, Oh, well, what is it? 
the little girl replied, well, he said that God is bigger than we are. He said that God is so big that the whole world could fit in the palm of God's hand. Is that true? And the mother replied, yes, honey, that's true. And he, she said, but mommy, he also said that God comes to live inside of us when we believe in Jesus. Is that true also? And again, the mother assured her daughter that that was true. Then with a puzzled look on her face, the little girl said, if God is bigger than us and lives in us, wouldn't God show through? Wouldn't God show through? I believe that little girl was right. If God lives in us, God definitely should show through us. And this is where the woes of the Beatitudes enter into the picture. If we are blessed in terms of happiness and wealth and physical comfort, we have a couple of questions that we have to ask ourselves. First, will we let God in? And second, will we let God show through? Woe to us if we don't, because we are losing out this section of the Sermon on the Plain is, is so harsh, though. If the poor and the hungry and the sad and the persecuted are living righteously before God, does that mean that we can only be blessed if we're poor or hungry or sad? First, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of fuzziness here. Some of us in this room are or have been poor or hungry or sad or persecuted. And some of us in this room may have avoided most of all of that. But the reality is that most of us move back and forth between those states of being. We seldom are only rich or only poor, only sad or only happy. We may be in one place today and then in a very different place tomorrow. Does that mean that we are blessed at one moment and cursed at the next? I don't think so. And even if most of us as middle class Americans are relatively wealthy or happy or unpersecuted, it's what we do with ourselves during those times when we're riding high that matters. If we let our money get in the way of righteously existing with God, then woe to us. If we let a false sense of security allow us to believe that we are self-sufficient and it gets in the way of us righteously existing with God, then woe to us. It's, it's not the fact that people are poor or hungry or persecuted or unhappy that makes them blessed. It's the fact that when we are in a vulnerable position, God may be all that we have. We may be in the best position to implement that phrase that you may have heard, let go and let God. At the times when we're really down, we may truly find ourselves depending on God as we always should and living in righteous existence with God. On the other hand, when we have enough, if we believe that we're doing just fine on our own, then woe to us, because the material comforts are getting in the way of our relationship with God. When it's all over, we may have a bit of money left, a full belly left, a few laughs, all the praise from our mutual admiration societies, but that's all. So I'd like to offer three of my own Beatitudes for you to consider today as people of God who are striving not to let our so-called blessings get between us and our relationships with God. The first one, blessed are those whom the world says are blessed, but who still live righteously with God in service to those that the world says are not blessed. And second, blessed are those who have much, but who love much also. And finally, one that considers our places, our spaces in this world. Blessed are those who are willing to come down from the mountaintop 
to serve on the plane, eye to eye with all of God's children. Amen. I invite you to gather around the table today. One of our scripture readings from the lectionary for today, for this Sunday, is from Jeremiah chapter 17. I'd like to read a couple of verses of it, 7 through 8. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. It's not always an easy thing to believe that God is working in our midst when times are a bit chaotic or strange or, or bleak, but that's precisely when we need to rely on God most. Through our tithes and our offerings, we respond to the needs of the world. We allow others to see our faith, to see our compassion, and to see God shining through. Please rise as we dedicate our morning's offerings and tithes. God is here at Christ's table. We meet the holy in gratefulness and in humility as we accept the invitation to come each week. This place of communion, this familiar place, never gets old, though. It never gets routine. We still experience the mystery every week in bread and in cup. God's grace and God's love spread before us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare for the upcoming Lenten season, help us to take this time to reflect on all the ways Jesus served and blessed his fellow man. He gave, gave comfort, encouragement, hope, and healing to those who were discouraged and downtrodden. He blessed each and every one with words and actions that encouraged them to follow his teachings. Yet he knew that the road ahead of him would be painful and challenging. With this in mind, Lord, as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, let us not be discouraged by everyday challenges we face. Let us strive to address the many worldwide problems we witness, to reach out to persons different from ourselves, and to share the word of Jesus Christ with love and acceptance that Jesus showed to all that he met. May we rejoice in knowing Jesus Christ gave us a path to follow, which can lead to peace, grace, and forgiveness. Amen. Amen.
on the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took a cup and he poured it, giving thanks to God. He said, this cup is the covenant renewed in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. The table is set. Partake in love and enjoy. Oh, now we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns. Sorry, I'm going to take this off. There we go. I think I, it's been causing some sound problems when I've had that on. So now I invite you to consider all your blessings in this world and consider how you might share those blessings with those who are not feeling quite so blessed in these moments. Please rise as we sing our final hymn of dedication, How Great Thou Art.
now may God lead you in paths of peace and in righteousness and in all manner of things good. So in peace, so with God. Amen. Thank you.